So this is what you get when you put all your points into charisma and strength. And like this guy somehow makes every movie and TV show he's in better, the cold, distant north takes every adventure to the next level of immersion and gravitas. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because it's cold or distant. Maybe it's the adventure feeling of having to contend with harsh weather and scarce resources in addition to your regular baddies. Maybe it's because it's so far away and isolated that people don't really give two shits about it. So if there's something monumentally evil brewing up there, chances are that when all hell breaks loose, if you are the hero of the story, you're going to be all alone to deal with it. And it's the cold, distant north of Faerun where our next stop on our road to Baldur's Gate 3 takes place. We're almost halfway through our journey, by the way, as this is the fifth review in the series. If you want to know what the rest of our reviewing journey has in store for you, check out our video on our road to Baldur's Gate 3. We'll leave a link for it in the description section down below. And while you're at it, why not subscribe? But for now, I bid you welcome to Baldur's Gate Carrot on a Stick Edition, also known as Icewind Dale, a game in which the carrot is the next MacGuffin you're going to chase, the stick is the NPC giving you the quest, and your ragtime band of adventurers are the donkeys. And I also bid you welcome to Yold Entertainment. My name is Alex, and it is my duty, my mission, my purpose in life to help you decide whether that game that you have been thumbing for so long is indeed the right game for you or not. And today we have a game that for some is Baldur's Gate without the bullshit, a game that's all about raw, unfiltered D&D goodness. For some others, it was Black Isle's shameless, blatant attempt at milking the Baldur's Gate cow to its last penny, while stripping it of everything that made its predecessor the timeless classic everyone loves. For us, the truth is somewhat in between, if leaning a little bit towards one of those two extremes. But which one? Let's find out, shall we? As you know, we rate games according to a system of categories that feels relevant to the game at hand. And today we have Icewind Dale Enhanced Edition. Yet again, a D&D based classic fantasy RPG that is, in many respects, a sequel of sorts to the Baldur's Gate series. When it comes to those, character creation and character progression are up first. So this is the fourth time in this series of reviews that I am going to be talking about the same character creation interface, and it is becoming quite the creative endeavor if I'm completely honest with you. Thankfully, this time around there are a few tiny details to make a difference. This is the same character creation interface we've seen in Baldur's Gate, Siege of Dragonspear, and Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Anne. But this time around, you can either gather the generic party of adventures the game has to offer to you and venture forth right away, or you can take the time to create your own party of generic adventurers before venturing forth. In Baldur's Gate, you had the option of creating your entire party, but the game had a huge cast of companions on offer, ready to join you in your adventure at one point or another during your voyage. So creating your own party wasn't the most appealing option in Baldur's Gate. This time around, though, the game very much encourages you to create your party of six. And to that end, you have all sorts of goody options. You can choose your character's gender, his or her class, race, archetype, which is a way to fine-grain your class, weapon proficiencies, and if you are a magic user, you have a few spells at your disposal, and some skills if you're a thief. You also have a wide assortment of portraits and voices. Portraits are finally spot on. While I like the portraits in Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2, none of them represented exactly what I wanted my character to look like. Icewind Dale finally scratched that edge in just the right way. Now, that being said, I still had to go through some trickery to reproduce my characters from Baldur's Gate 2, and some of my favorite companions. I had a druid named Jahera, a wild mage named Nero, and a dwarven priest named Jeslik, and just the right portraits to go with them. And that takes us neatly along to my first complaint about character creation mechanics in Icewind Dale. This game was the closest thing you got to a sequel to Baldur's Gate 2 back in the day. It takes place in the same fantasy setting, and it has the same mechanics for the most part. Because of all of this, the fact that Black Isle decided not to provide you with any means to continue your adventure from Baldur's Gate 2 was a monumental wasted opportunity in my estimation. Given the way in which Icewind Dale was designed, adding a feature that would allow you to import your party from Baldur's Gate seemed like a no-brainer to me. Maybe they could have brought back the voice actors from Baldur's Gate, have them do some party banter or emit a few opinions about your actions every now and then, maybe have them reminisce about adventures from the good old times. Not being able to import at least your main character from Baldur's Gate 2 was a huge disappointment for me. As I said, I still managed to get a taste of the aforementioned experience by reproducing some of my good old companions, but it was not the same. Beamdog had a golden opportunity to set this straight with their enhanced edition of Icewind Dale, and I can't believe they let it slip. Like Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale follows the advanced 2nd edition D&D ruleset, which means that you have very little control over your character's progress skill-wise. Most of the time, especially for non-magic users like fighters, your role in your character's leveling will be limited to clicking the level up button and then the done button. Well, at least you can't screw that up. Or can you? 
Every once in a while you get to add a point to a weapon proficiency and if you're a magic user you get to assign spells to some additional spell slots that become available to you when you level. And well, that's it. Some people say that in games like Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale, your character's progress is less about learning this skill or improving that attribute, and more about the items that you come by while braving the dungeons. I think that developers should provide the player with some sort of skill leveling mechanics to allow him or her to build his or her character around his or her preferred strategic approach. And if there are items to be found, ideally, at least some of them should be good or bad to the character depending on whether or not they add value to the player's tactical approach. Take Grim Dawn for example. You choose two classes, and chances are that you'll choose them depending on whether or not they suit your strategic approach to the game. Let's say you're a ritualist, a combination of necromancer and occultist, and you've decided that you're going to be in the business of summoning creatures. There are many other ways to go on about being a ritualist, but your cup of tea is to let minions and pets do most of your dirty work for you. It is only logical that you devote all your skill points to those skills. And although there's tons of loot in Grim Dawn, it never becomes unimportant, as there's only precious few items that will actually help you towards your goal of becoming a Master Summoner. The moral of this story is that skills and items should work in synergy to make your character better at whatever you wish him or her to be. In Icewind Dale, you decide for example that your Dwarven Defender is going to be your tank. And that's it. There's very little tactical honing to add to that. You find some cool gear and yes, you have to work hard to get the best gear in the game, but the perks that these items offer, though usually really useful, feel detached from whatever tactical plan you're going for with your character. I can see some people being okay with this leveling mechanics, I can see some people coming to terms with it and putting the whole affair behind them, like I did, and I can see some people disliking it to no end. If we had to put a number on it, this would be it. Gameplay. Allow me to regale you with a story, dear viewer. This is the story of a friend who spent 9 years with a boyfriend she didn't even like. Oftentimes her other friends would ask her, Why'd he go out with them? To which she'd answer, Because he was not like that when I first met him. To which her other friends would say, Well, but you know he is like that now. Now you know him. So why don't you leave him? To which my friend would say something along the lines of, I know he's different. I know he can change. Well, dear viewer, if you didn't have this old gamer to warn you about these things, this could have very well been your story with Icewind Dale. Icewind Dale can be fiendishly deceitful, even to those who have played Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2. Actually, let me correct that. It'll be particularly deceitful to those who have played Baldur's Gate or Baldur's Gate 2. You start the game at the local tavern in East Haven, one of the ten towns of Icewind Dale. You're talking to the acting major as he gives you the basics about the city and tells you about this adventure expedition he and some other adventurers in town are about to embark upon. After that brief chat you can go outside, talk to some people around town and perform a few tasks for them. Some of them can be even completed in more than one way. You do some exploration to pinpoint the location of the local temple, the inn and the store, because that's what you do when you know what's what in a D&D game, and one of the missions has you engaging in combat, just in case you're starting to miss all the arse whipping from your previous adventures in Baldur's Gate. And if all that seems like good old, familiar and proper Baldur's Gating with an icy flavor, it's because it is. But spoiler alert, you are being played. After you're done with your tasks around town, you set out on an expedition to Kaldahar, a city that desperately needs whatever help East Haven can throw their way. So your party sets out to Kaldahar with the rest of the adventurers from East Haven, and then some unexpected event changes your plans dramatically. This event makes it so that the only way out of your predicament is to push forward and find your way to Kaldahar on your own. Although it's a bit of a cliche by now, I find this sort of plot device to be interesting and exciting, and it worked for me at this point of the story. So far so good. You save your own hide by the skin of your teeth and find yourself in an unknown location. There's combat to be had in this new place, but you can also run into a couple of characters who have this or that to say about the area and some of its happenings. One of them is an ogre who seems to be living in an abandoned tower in the middle of nowhere. The ogre tells your party about some weird magical headache that won't let him be. If you have a druid, and I think this can only happen if you have a druid in your party, you can have him or her talk to the ogre about some natural berry-based remedy to his ailment. The ogre buys the story and leaves the tower, which you can now use as a headquarter of sorts to rest safely without any risk of being jumped by monsters. So this ogre business gives you the pleasant familiar feeling that your choices and even the classes of the characters in your party will have an impact on how things will play out in the game. Ah yes, this definitely has the makings of a spot on Baldur's Gate sequel, but we'll see about that.
So after exploring the area, killing a few monsters, finding some loot and looking into some strange occurrences, you finally arrive to the town of Kaldahar, your original destination. So time to see what's going on around this town. What is going on is that some people want you to do a few things for them. Things it seems that require you to venture outside the city, but more on that later. Sooner or later you'll run into Arundel, the town's elder and its leader. He's the guy that asks the town of East Haven to lend a hand with its many problems in the first place. So Arundel is a druid, and if you have a warrior or a mage in your party talk to him, they will have some very basic questions about the druids and their ways. Which seems logical, as they are not themselves druids. Hmm, let's load a previous saved game and have the druid in our party have that conversation instead. Maybe she won't have to ask silly questions like, what sort of balance are you talking about? And nope, she has the exact same things to say to him. So maybe Icewind Dale is not as Baldur's Gatey as I originally thought? We'll see. Chances are that shortly, if not immediately after having this conversation with Arundel, you'll be embarking upon the never-ending carrot on a stick chase that is Icewind Dale. Your first mission is to gather whatever information you can at the Vale of Shadows, and this will be but your first taste of Icewind Dale's devilish formula. And this is the formula. NPC asks you to get a piece of information or MacGuffin, you go to the place where this piece of information or MacGuffin is meant to be found, the place is huge and littered with monsters and bad guys, you clear them all out, you find the person, monster, or whatever this is, who is in possession of the MacGuffin, you retrieve the MacGuffin from that person, monster, or creature, and you return to the NPC. Rinse and repeat throughout the entire freaking game. And that's the structure of every chapter in Icewind Dale. So when it comes to classic RPGs, especially those which are meant to be successors to Baldur's Gate, you probably expect the gameplay to consist of combat, exploration, and questing. The way I see it, this formulaic structure we mentioned seriously cripples exploration and questing in Icewind Dale. Locations become available on the map only if you have received a quest that demands you to go to them. There are no cities, towns, or other places for you to drop by to see what's up and therefore, there are no new unexpected characters, quests, or locations to be discovered by kicking around the map as there were in Baldur's Gate 2, for example. And while locations are huge, and I do mean huge, there's not much exploration to be done in them either. There are some rooms that you can enter and ransack out of adventurous curiosity, but not too many. There are side quests, surprisingly, in Icewind Dale. As we mentioned before, some people in Kaldahar ask you to fetch this or look into that, but you don't have to go out of your way to get these side quests done, nor put any effort into figuring them out. If you're thorough enough, you will almost inevitably complete all your side quests by simply traversing every location in pursuit of your carrot on a stick or your main mission. I don't think they should even be called side quests, as there barely are any sides to your main path and objectives. So, you can forget about dedicating time to side quests as means to take a break from your main mission. That's not how things work in Icewind Dale. So, that leaves us combat. And is it any good? While I had a blast with it during most of the time I spent with the game, I have to concede that chances are that your experience will greatly vary depending on your history with RPGs and D&D in particular. This is the way I see it. If you're a casual player who's into every genre and your experience with classic RPGs is only, well, casual, Icewind Dale will absolutely crush you like an insignificant, sick, and pathetic fly. It'll pulverize your dreams, your hopes, and your self-esteem to the point of giving you erectile dysfunction. It happened to a friend of mine. This game is not there to hold your hand or tell you what what. It totally assumes that you're a seasoned Baldur's Gate veteran. After all, why wouldn't you be? If you have some experience with new or old RPGs, you probably know the basics about having a tank, healer, and DPS specialists in your party. You probably know your formations, which targets to prioritize, and your flanking, kiting, and choking points tactics. If this is the case, you'll find combat in Icewind Dale to be challenging but fun. And if you're a seasoned D&D veteran, and if you played the original Icewind Dale back in the year 2001, you probably don't need me to tell you that you'll have to crank up the difficulty higher than core rules to find your fun. One thing that I like about Icewind Dale's combat is that it challenges your tactical mindset rather than your knowledge of spell protection and statuses. Challenges varied, there are overwhelming hordes of enemies. Enemies that know who to prioritize in your party and use some interesting tactics of their own that seem to make the best out of their strengths. What you don't have is a slew of enemies that have every immunity and resistance in the book and one obscure weakness that you won't get a chance to figure out during your first encounter with it. And I can't begin to tell you how grateful I am for this. I have to admit that while I was playing Icewind Dale to make this review, every time I started to play the game, it felt a little bit like a chore. I was like, 
well okay, let's get to it. But after a few minutes of Icewind Alien arse whipping and skull bashing, time began to fly and hours started to feel like minutes. And every time I ended up having a hard time trying to call it a day. And that's always a good sign. Level design in Icewind Dale is more complex and tactically relevant than it was in its predecessors. Black Isle knew what they were doing. Combat was to be the name of the game, and they went for a level design that suited the combat perfectly. You could say that Icewind Dale set out to do only one thing, and they did that one thing very right if you ask me. There were some pretty intense and long fights that made me feel like a master tactician when things went my way. And when they didn't, I could always set things straight with good decisions or maybe reloading and doing some things differently. Gameplay as a package was a bit of a mixed bag for me. While I felt a little bit cheated with a deceitfully linear gameplay that's also almost completely devoid of exploration or questing, I did have a blast with the combat. And I think that clever area and dungeon design for almost every of the locations I visited is to be credited for this. I would say there were enough exciting moments and high enough stakes to keep the gameplay in Icewind Dale just outside the meh territory. Story and Lore For a game that's one big endless chain of MacGuffin chases, the story isn't all that bad. The stakes feel high at all times, it is competently written for the most part, and there's a decent amount of good old D&D Forgotten Realms lore thrown in for good measure. Dialogues have some of that good old Baldur's Gatian humor that I've come to love, but they can also be unexpectedly deep and memorable at times. My favorite thing about the story is that during your travels, you get to piece together one of the many bloody episodes of Faerun's history. This time it's the story about dwarves and elves putting aside their differences to face a common enemy, and of how their distrust for each other eventually turned their alliance sour and ended up spilling doom for both races. Your adventure takes you to a couple of places that bear testimony to the aftermath of the tragic ending of this alliance, and allows you to dig more interesting lore about the conflict. It is not terribly relevant to your mission, but it's well written enough to elicit some adventurous curiosity. For me, ultimately learning what happened between the dwarves and the elves, and why, did bring a certain degree of satisfaction and closure, and it also seasoned an adventure that would have otherwise felt terribly linear and predictable. There's also a couple of things for you to uncover while you explore the many areas and dungeons of the game. These bits of lore add context to the places you explore and to the few characters that you meet. They're nothing spectacular, but they manage to keep your tour de force of butt kicking interesting. It also has some interesting story devices like that event we talked about that leaves you no choice but to push forward to overcome your predicament. But unfortunately, the story also resorts to a few dated tropes and cliches that would be a huge no-go by today's standards, and would come off as cringefully amateurish to most literary agents nowadays. One such example is the cinematic prologue of the game. All by itself, the story told in the intro is badass, but there's a problem with it. This prologue tells the tale of people and events that happened way before your character's time in the story. And unless you take the time to go to the temple in East Haven and talk to its priest Everard long enough to get him to spill his beans about his opinion on the hero Jarrod, this prologue will be completely meaningless and inconsequential to your adventure. And even if you do talk to Everard about Jarrod and his sacrifice, there is no further mention of the hero, and no further interaction with the priest himself until almost at the very end of the game. That epic prologue about Jarrod and his sacrifice, and your conversation with Everard about him not respecting Jarrod's decision, constitute a very poor effort at a character arc for Everard. A man who you'll only meet at the very beginning and at the very end of the game. A man who seems to change his heart about Jarrod's sacrifice all of a sudden, and who offers an overly explained but ultimately weak argument to justify his change of heart. And all that felt like it had to happen because the plot needed it, and that's not the hallmark of a great story, let me tell you. Unfortunately, these contrivances take place at the very end of the game, and it makes the whole narrative aspect of the game feel rushed and unsatisfying. I found the bits and pieces of lore about the main creatures and spirits roaming around the locations I had to go to while I was chasing the carrot to be much more interesting than the story itself. And while it had its moments and this cold, isolated North vibe going on, which I very much dig, as a package, I can't say I was impressed. Companions lore-wise. I must admit that I am a bit on the fence about this one. There are no companions for you to meet during your adventures. No one joins in because he or she needs to, nor for any other reason really. You create your entire band of adventurers, and they are as generic as they come. I roleplayed as hard as I could by reproducing my characters and some of my other companions from Baldur's Gate 2, but your previous adventures are something that Icewind Dale is just not concerned with in the least. There are more than enough forum posts on the internet about importing your characters from Baldur's Gate or Baldur's Gate 2 to make it abundantly clear that a large part of the game's audience, myself included, was expecting this to be a thing. Also, walking about with a group of adventurers who seem not to give two shits about anything gets old and eventually starts feeling lonesome, even with all the humorous and clever dialogue options that you have at your disposal when talking to NPCs. 
but it's not like companions are poorly implemented in the game. It's more like a feature that the developers just didn't include at all. So I'll say it does not apply, but with many, oh so many footnotes. Companions gameplay wise. This is a wet dream for those who are all about the right party. I've known people who love going for some other than the obvious warrior or fighter class as their tank. Some like to have clerics or paladins as their main tanks. Others like shape-shifting druids. Others like to have a tank, a healer, and then a bunch of jacks of all trades instead of a traditional party. Different strokes for different folks. But since you create your entire party in Icewind Dale, whatever your idea might be of the right party, Icewind Dale's got you covered. Secondary mechanics. These are the same as the ones in Baldur's Gate, and that means they're dated. Not bad, just dated. Hovering over weapons and armor does not bring up a comparison chart, and this time around, even picking up an item does not bring up a comparison chart like it did in Baldur's Gate. You have to equip the item and check how your stats change. Buying and selling stuff, equipping your gear, and managing your party still feel like a comfy old pair of shoes. But that's not enough for me to say that secondary mechanics are good. Sound effects and mix. The sound design in the Enhanced Edition of Icewind Dale is almost exactly the same as the one we got in Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2. Weapon impacts sound exactly the same regardless of which weapon you're using or the type of armor your enemy is wearing, spells don't sound terribly different from each other, and some other sounds seem to be missing. I felt like this time around I got less volume and clipping issues, but the game is still very far from being perfect in this respect. There's something particularly weird about the sound in the last chapter. There's Virfneblin gnomes walking about, and they sound like 9 foot tall golems rather than, well, gnomes. Sound might be marginally better than its predecessor, but it's definitely not great. Voice acting. I see. What do you intend to do? Please, you must make haste. Time works against us. We must discover the source of this evil before the balance is altered irrevocably. It is a war of principles. It is a campaign waged on behalf of fundamental truths. Oceans of belief wearing away at basalt pillars of understanding that have held up the simple religions and philosophies of worlds like this for millennia. Take no prisoners! Your companions are speechless for the most part in Icewind Dale, so you won't get anything more than the occasional I'm listening. Or the occasional What is required? From any of them. NPCs though are partially voiced, and the quality of their voice acting and delivery is all over the place. I think it's also worth mentioning that Baldur's Gate 2, for example, is a monster of a game in terms of the sheer amount of content and situations that may or may not present themselves depending on a series of conditions. So I would say it is more than understandable and excusable that not every piece of dialogue is voiced. The story and gameplay in Icewind Dale are a lot more linear than in Baldur's Gate 2, and I think that there's a lot less dialogue too, or at least, a lot less dialogue that depends on how you play the game or on the dialogue choices you make. So not having fully voiced NPCs feels a little bit like a minimum effort to deal this time around. In addition to that, while some performances are decent and some dialogue lines punch way above the weight of the overall quality of the writing in this game, Icewind Dale also features some of the most hilariously bad voice acting in the series. Over. Over? On the contrary. My time has only just begun! Unfortunately, as it happened with the story, they also saved the worst for last in this respect. The voice acting in Icewind Dale is easily one of the worst in the series. Music. Yeah. 
When we made the introductory video of our Road to Baldur's Gate 3 review series, we had no doubt we had to choose the most epic piece from the most epic soundtrack amongst all the soundtracks in all of the games. And we also had no doubt that this was going to be Icewind Dale's soundtrack. As memorable and epic as some of the other soundtracks are in this series, this one trounces them all thoroughly. The title track is second to none. The track that plays when you're walking about Kuldahar is the quintessential medieval fantasy immersion piece, and the combat, which is already pretty good in Icewind Dale, is taken to the next level thanks to the music. Oddly enough, it also has the most out of place track in the series. I even had to tap out of the game to make sure it was not some crazy video from YouTube that had started playing. Though this track would probably be enough to knock off a perfect score, I just can't bring myself to do it. Graphics. Oh, the cold, desolate, distant north that makes everything better. Well played, Icewind Dale. Locations in Icewind Dale have the same graphic quality to them as they do in Baldur's Gate 2, but there's a lot less going on this time around. East Haven and Kaldahar are tiny villages that are barely worth calling towns, and there seems to be a lot less going on in them than in the city of Baldur's Gate or the city of Am. There's also large chunks in many of the locations that are covered in snow and ice, very convenient for the setting, and I would say also for the artists. Item and character models are exactly the same as they were in Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2, and we have already established how dated they all look. It's a bit disappointing that superior items look almost exactly the same as regular items. There are a couple of cool new monsters and creatures, but they're nothing to write home about. The package is serviceable when it comes to delivering proper D&D medieval immersion though, and while that's good enough for me, I can see quite a few people not being crazy about it. Performance and Stability Icewind Dale froze, no pun intended, a couple of times, but only very briefly. The game never crashed and I didn't encounter any relevant bugs to speak of. There are however quite a few rooms in which you will be attacked by a surrounding mob as soon as you enter, and in some of the more complex ones, the game placed some of my characters, typically the most fragile ones, who were in the back of my formation for a reason, in some very odd places where they would be more likely to get attacked. And while this was annoying at first, seeing it as an additional challenge helped me flip that page. While not perfect, performance and stability were mostly solid all the way through. Other considerations and final thoughts. Questing and exploration are irrelevant in Icewind Dale. Also, there are no branching paths that depend on your dialogue choices as there are in Baldur's Gate 2. Lore is solid and immersive, but the main story is little more than a decently written succession of MacGuffin chases that add context to a gameplay that boils down to traveling to a location, clearing levels upon levels of enemies, and retrieving the next piece of the puzzle. If you're hyped about Baldur's Gate 3 because you've played Divinity Original Sin 2 and or because you've seen the trailers and footage of the game and you feel Baldur's Gate 3 might just be a game that's right up your alley, but you have little experience with D&D titles and you're not willing to dive into a slew of titles from the early and mid-2000s in preparation for Baldur's Gate 3, this is most definitely not a game you should be picking. If you haven't done so, pick up Baldur's Gate 2 instead. But if you already picked up Baldur's Gate and or Baldur's Gate 2, and you've just recently played them for the first time, as I know some of you have, because you want to jump into Baldur's Gate 3 with as much information and hype as you can muster, and you ended up loving these titles, the good news is that Icewind Dale adds more combat and lore that will feel familiar to you, and at the very least, it'll keep you entertained for a few more dozen hours. And that's all I have for you today. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thank you for watching all the way up until now. If you like what you're seeing in this channel, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to avoid the usual YouTube shenanigans. Share the video, but most importantly, never stop gaming, but don't let gaming get in the way of your hopes and dreams. Bye, everyone.